Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's June 5th, and I'm back from attending the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers annual meeting in Nashville, Tennessee. If you aren't familiar with the Consortium of MS Centers, or CMSC, It's an organization that's dedicated to improving and advancing the standards of care for those living with MS through educational programs, pilot research projects, and mentoring for healthcare professionals. Their annual meeting is really an educational conference of over 2,000 healthcare practitioners and researchers, all specializing in the field of multiple sclerosis. The meeting had a number of symposium presentations that provided attendees with in-depth information on topics that included depression in MS, the latest news and research on disease-modifying therapies, caregiving for families living with MS, quality of life issues, epidemiology, neuropsychiatry, imaging biomarkers, rehabilitation, symptom management, and progressive multiple sclerosis. I was honored to participate in a symposium on progressive MS that was led by the International Progressive MS Alliance. While I was at the Consortium of MS Center's annual meeting, I learned all about the Pediatric MS Alliance from Jill Blackburn. I met Dr. Miriam Franco and learned about the very cool app that she's developed and you'll want to download and try. And I sat down with Dr. Rosalind Kalb and MS activist Marcus Jones to find out more about MS Path to Care, a new set of educational modules designed to empower people living with MS to be active participants in their own care and treatment. In just a moment, you'll hear all of my conversations with these amazing people, but first, there are a few other things that you should know about. In a study presented at the CMSC annual meeting, researchers demonstrated that treatment with Ocrevus may improve cognitive ability in MS patients with relapsing remitting MS. In the study, researchers recruited patients with relapsing remitting MS who were considered at increased risk for developing progressive MS. They divided them into two groups. One group was given Ocrevus while the other group was given interferon beta-1A, which is known commercially as Avonex and Rebif. Both groups of patients were given a simple digit modalities test to measure their cognition every 12 weeks during the 96-week study. And over the course of the 96-week study, the patient group that was given Ocrevus showed a greater improvement in cognition. Since cognitive impairment is common in MS patients and can have real serious impact on their quality of life, this is an important discovery that requires more investigation. If you're a regular listener to the podcast, then you've heard me on more than one occasion talk about how depression can get in the way of every other aspect of MS self-care. My working theory has been and continues to be that depression acts as the gatekeeper on the road to MS rehabilitation and symptom management. I've said that if someone is living with depression, then they aren't as likely to show up at their rehabilitation appointment or follow through with symptom management treatments. And since we know that about 50% of the people living with MS are likely to be diagnosed with depression, this becomes an important problem to be solved. Well, while I was at the CMSC annual meeting, researchers reported on a study that really serves to further my past rants about depression getting in the way of people living with MS. This study demonstrated that depression and fatigue, 
two of the most common symptoms of MS, may predict how a person is going to adhere to their disease-modifying therapy. In plain English, depression and fatigue may stop someone from taking their MS prescription drugs. So we can move past depression stopping someone from showing up at a rehabilitation appointment because this study indicates that the ante has been raised. Depression and fatigue may stop someone from taking the medication that will help manage their MS and slow its progression. The researchers looked at 499 MS patients whose status had been reported during clinical visits through the Beck Depression Inventory, the Modified Fatigue Impact Scale, and the Morisky Medication Adherence Scale. The investigators also looked at results from standardized, validated, computerized cognitive testing and the Enhanced Disability Status Scale, or EDSS. And the researchers also looked at demographic information about these 499 patients, including age, gender, marital status, employment, and the number of different disease-modifying therapies that each patient had tried. 114 patients, or 41.8%, had a high adherence to their MS medications. And 159 patients, or 58.2%, had medium to low adherence to their MS medications. And patients with higher rates of depression and fatigue were significantly more likely to have lower adherence rates to their MS prescription meds. And by the way, higher adherence to MS medications was demographically associated with men who were at an older age. And this is important information because it raises a couple of red flags that we should take notice of. First, it demonstrates a connection between depression and fatigue and how likely it is that someone will adhere to taking their MS medications as prescribed. And second, the study identifies older men as the group most likely to adhere to taking their MS meds as prescribed. And since two-thirds of the patients living with MS are women, this requires some careful thinking. The effectiveness of any disease-modifying treatment seems to matter less if the patient is less likely to adhere to taking their medication as prescribed. So this is a subject that needs further explanation and some workable answers. How can we more consistently use validated methods to screen for depression during an office visit? How can we better reach people living with MS who are living with depression? And what might be the most effective path for ensuring that people living with MS remain motivated to stay on their medication as prescribed by their neurologist? These are tricky questions because the answers won't be found by looking through a microscope. But answering these questions ensures that whatever is discovered by looking through a microscope will actually benefit the patient population that it's designed for. A few weeks ago, my guest on the podcast was David Mitchell, the founder and president of Patients for Affordable Drugs, an organization that advocates for lower and more reasonable costs for prescription drugs, which is something that everyone living with MS in the United States should clearly understand as the cost of disease-modifying therapies have continued to rise at an astronomical rate. But imagine a system where we didn't have to rely on the efforts of an advocacy organization and instead had a government agency advocate for lower prescription drug prices on our behalf. That system exists in the UK, and while it may not be perfect because nothing ever is, they've managed to cut the cost of some MS medications. In the United Kingdom, there's an organization called the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence. The acronym for this organization is NICE, and I don't mean that they have a NICE acronym. The actual acronym for the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence is N-I-C-E, NICE. And NICE provides guidance to the National Health Service, which controls the medical treatments that British citizens receive. And if NICE doesn't approve a treatment, then the National Health Service won't pay for it. 
So this past December, NICE took the drastic action and recommended that four MS disease-modifying therapies should not be prescribed for new MS patients. These treatments included Avonex, Betaferon, Plegrity, and Rebif. Copaxone was also added to the list. So if you were living in the UK and your neurologist wanted to prescribe a beta interferon treatment for you, the only one available was Extavia. And the reason that Extavia was available was because Novartis, the manufacturer, agreed to sell it to the National Health Service at a discount. Now, we know that people living with MS don't all respond to MS medications the same way. Some prescription medications work better than other prescription medications for some people. So losing several beta interferon therapies posed a problem. But the problem has now been at least mostly resolved because Avonex, Copaxone, and Rebif are back on the list of approved MS medications. And the reason they're back on that list is simple. Their manufacturers agreed to lower the cost. So it seems that at least in the UK, when drug manufacturers were faced with what would have amounted to a national boycott, they found ways to lower the price of their prescription drugs. If and how this sort of negotiation could ever be replicated here in the United States is a tricky and complex question. But if we ever got to the point of replicating this sort of negotiation, at least we now know what the likely outcome would be. At the CMSC annual meeting, I met Jill Blackburn from the Pediatric MS Alliance. Jill and I talked about how the Pediatric MS Alliance supports families living with pediatric MS in ways that go far beyond just providing medical information. Here's what Jill and I talked about. So I'm talking with Jill Blackburn, who is with the Pediatric Multiple Sclerosis Alliance. Uh, Jill is also an imaging technologist, MRI and CT at Barrows Neurologic in Arizona. And um, Jill, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Pediatric MS Alliance is all about? Love to. Thank you. So our goal is to connect, support, and advocate for the parents of children who have been diagnosed with MS or any similar demyelinating disease. Our goal is to try to connect them to the right physicians, help them navigate the insurance issues with medications, and to help with school problems, getting 504 and IEP plans adhered to. Anything that the parents need as far as support, that's that's what we're there for. So I'm looking at uh, one of the banners you have in your booth behind us, and uh, it indicates that you connect parents not only in the U.S., but around the world. So talk to me a little bit about how you uh, how your reach extends. So we are a web-based group. We have a Facebook page, which is how most of the parents find us. If they do a Google search, that's where they end up. Once the uh, parents get in, they can start asking questions. We welcome them into the group and just say, ask anything, because we know it's overwhelming in the beginning. We have families from all over the world. We've recently had an influx in Australia, South Africa. Finding um, out that you're not alone is just so important to these parents. And then finding maybe there's somebody that lives only an hour away in a remote city in, in Australia. We were able to connect to f uh, two families that live there that had no idea there was another kid nearby with MS. So what are the challenges that a family living with uh, pediatric MS is, uh, what are they up against? Where to start? <laughs> so probably the biggest issue historically has been with medications. There are there have been no medications approved for pediatric use until just recently when Jelenia was was a, was announced a couple of weeks ago. It's an insurance battle because there are no drugs approved for pediatric use. All of the children are on these drugs off label. So the insurance initially will deny and then so we help the parents navigate through what do you do after the drug is denied? How do we get the medication and if we can't, where do we go from here? School is another issue because um, the kids don't look sick sometimes. They're not all going to be in a wheelchair or have a cast on their arms. So it's hard sometimes to make the schools understand fatigue or vision issues or cognitive delay. 
So we try to help the parents navigate through the school systems and, and help them when they're having trouble um, getting, their, getting an education for their child. Is, is this more like providing advice or do you actually have materials that you share with parents who are in need of this kind of stuff? We have materials, and we we have a lot of verbal advice as well. Um, Given that we're international, we have discovered that the insurance and the school systems obviously are quite different in other countries. So the rules here might not apply to the country next door. So sometimes it's just advice on, here's how we kind of circumvented this or, or who we spoke to, and it might apply in another country. So sometimes the written material helps, and sometimes the just the verbal conversation helps as well. So once we get past the medications and the school issues, I imagine parents are still left to deal with the social issues that their kids might be facing. As you pointed out, MS can be an invisible disease. So here you have a student who may be getting quote unquote special treatment at school and yet to all the other kids, they seem fine. Is that also something that you offer support and advice on? Absolutely. We'll offer some guidance and support to the parents on how to deal with with some of these issues. I know the kids just don't want to be different. They don't want to be special. They don't want to be um, to stand out from the other kids. So when they go into a school setting and they are allowed to have a fan with them or they're allowed to wear sunglasses or they get to take the elevator and the other kids don't, it's, it's just such an uncomfortable situation for them. They just want to fit in. They want to be normal. A lot of times they will refuse those uh, accommodations from the school just because they don't want to be noticed and they're struggling and they're starting to fail classes. So it's, it's such a fine line to walk where we need to make sure that they're being given the best opportunity and yet just try to make them have a normal childhood. It's important. The, 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 the freshman boy wants to play football. The, you know, the, the senior girl wants to go to her prom. We just need to figure out how to make that happen. You know, I was talking a few weeks ago on the podcast with uh, Dr. Emmanuel Vobant at UCSF, uh, who's done an awful lot of work in the realm of pediatric MS. And we were talking about how, you know, while so much of the world tends to look at MS as a uh, disease that people between 20 and 50 get, it clearly isn't. And, and I, I mentioned the fact that not only are, are, are these kids dealing with MS, at the same time, they're dealing with growing up. They're dealing with being kids, being adolescents. And my goodness, that, that has a whole set of pressures and challenges attached to it without MS. It must be multiplied so many more times when you're also dealing with a chronic illness. Most definitely. And actually, Dr. Wabant was my daughter's uh, doctor. One of, the, one of the things, too, that I think that, that families need to be aware of, and physicians as well, is that drug compliance with the kids is going to be a whole different issue than it is with the adults. Imagine a, you know, a teenage girl that's going to need to give herself shots in the arms and legs and wants to go to a swimming party. She's, she might not give herself the shots that day because she doesn't want that anybody to see you know, the, the, the marks on her arms. Another kid who has to go to an infusion center and he knows he's going to feel sick and, and there's just so many different challenges that, that, that the parents go through with the different population. The fact that we've had two-year-olds diagnosed with MS and that we have a group where people continue to find us should reiterate, kids get MS. Don't turn it away. Don't turn it into something else. Don't turn it into it's it's just fatigue. It's, you know, I don't want to go to school. I'm tired. It's a legitimate disease that children get, and we need to address it. Well, thanks for helping us do just that. Thank you very much. While I was at the CMSC annual meeting, I met psychologist, certified MS specialist, and guided imagery specialist, Dr. Miriam Franco. Dr. Franco told me about ImageWork, her new app available as a free download for iPhones through the Apple App Store and Android smartphones through Google Play. Here's how Dr. Franco explained the ways that ImageWork can help people living with multiple sclerosis. I'm talking with Dr. Miriam Franco, who is a psychologist, a certified MS specialist, and a guided imagery specialist. So I guess the combination of the above is what's led her to imagery work. And there is 
an amazing new app that's available for free download that you're going to want to know about. But first, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Franco. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Tell us a little bit about this new app, what it's all about, and where we can find it as well. Thank you. My new app is called Imagery Work. It has an entire page on the app that is devoted to using relaxation and guided imagery for MS. So there's a track, a free download track called De-Stress 101, which helps you learn how to become deeply relaxed, then use sensory imagery to lower stress, anxiety, tension headaches, uh, stiffness, shift pain experience, and promote rest and well-being. If you then subscribe to the app, which is $2.99 a month, you get all these MS tracks that are beyond De-Stress 101. You have a track for reducing anxiety and injection anxiety. There's a separate track for uh, reducing MRI-related anxiety. And then there's a separate track for relieving caregiver stress. And elsewhere on my app, under Improving Mood, there's a short exercise called Going to a Safe Place, which is wonderful to do during rest periods, when you're on an infusion, or when you just need to anchor yourself before the next challenge. As you were describing the various MS tracks, uh, infusion site, MRI, caregiver stress, this is like answering the questions and kind of speaking directly to the issues that are affecting families living with MS. That's right. And some people don't know what relaxation and guided imagery is. First, you learn how to get deeply relaxed. Then you add sensory images and you're guided through sensory exercises. Unlike meditation, with guided imagery, you don't have to practice it all the time. You practice it a few times and then you weave back and forth when you need it. And if you're very anxious and don't want to be alone in your own head with a lot of anxious thoughts, guided imagery relaxes the body first and then the mind just follows and moves in and out of relaxed states. So it's very easy to learn. It's good for all kinds of learners. It's fast. It's effective. It doesn't hurt and it's a lot of fun. It's a free download, and with that, the people who download the app are going to download it with DeStress 101, and then if they see that that's working for them and want to explore further, they can subscribe for less than the price of coffee at their favorite coffee place, uh, two ninety nine a month, and get access to all of that additional content. That's right. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. They say that knowledge is power, and MS Path to Care is a new online resource that's designed to empower people living with MS to become full partners in their treatment and care. I sat down with Dr. Rosalind Kalb, Vice President of the Professional Resource Center at the National MS Society, and MS activist Marcus Jones to talk about how MS Path to Care can benefit people living with MS. I'm talking with Dr. Rosalind Kalb and Marcus Jones about a program called MS Path to Care. And I thought a good place to start, Dr. Kalb, is maybe you taking us through what MS Path to Care is all about. It's a new initiative to help educate people living with MS and their support partners um, about how to be active participants in their own care, how to work collaboratively with their healthcare team to optimally manage their symptoms of MS, their life with MS. Um, and MS Path to Care offers them the resources to do that. So information specifically about who on the healthcare team can help you manage your symptoms, um, how, to, how to work with them effectively, communicate with them, what your needs and priorities are. It also talks about what other resources aside from the healthcare team can help 
manage MS. Um, and lastly, there's a module of MS Cath to Pair that, that talks about how one takes care of one's support partner, because we know that support partners um, are key to the health and well-being of the person with MS, but they also have needs, feelings, priorities of their own that often get overlooked or neglected because of the focus on the person with MS. So together, these modules really help the whole family manage the very um, individual and unpredictable needs that arise when one's living with MS. I think that's so important, too, because as I think we all know, um, MS tends to affect families, not just individuals. And it's good to hear about a program that has taken that into consideration and it's very designed. Absolutely. Uh, the key priority um, for MS Path to Care. So Marcus, why do you think it matters? Why is it important for people who are living with MS to be participants and take an active role with their healthcare team? So MS is such an individualized disease. It affects everyone differently, right? So it's not like when you go to your primary care and they say, run a test, they say you have strep throat, I'm going to give you some medication, and then you're fine. Most of the time, there's kind of a trial and error you know, feel to it. Okay, we're going to put you on this medication. Let's have a conversation about what your lifestyle is. Will you be able to adhere to this therapy? For example, if you, if you're like me and you're active, maybe you want your medication to be one time a day, whereas someone else who has a more clockwork schedule can have it, can take their medication two times a day and not even ever forget that, you know, forget a dose. So it's really important that you have a good relationship with your doctor so you can talk through your lifestyle and they can match you up with the right treatments, the right therapies, and all those things that will help you live your best life possible. So how should someone living with MS kind of approach the MS Path to Care program? What, what's, what's the best route for them to take? How do they get involved with it? So, you know, we have a lot of modules on the website. Um, MSPathToCare.com, and I would suggest them for any any MS, um, you know, any MS patient, but also especially for folks who are initially diagnosed and don't know where to turn. There's so many resources out there that will give you information, but they don't kind of tie it up in a bow and and present it practically all the time. And I think MS Path to Care does a really good job of doing that. Well, yeah, I think that's really important, especially for people who are newly diagnosed to know where they can go and get information that's easy to digest uh, because at, at the time of diagnosis, you are full of questions, probably more than a couple of concerns, and getting quality information is so important, especially today when all of our information is coming to us online. It's not all quite the same quality of information and it's important to get to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff to find the the kind of information that is going to help you instead of take you down the wrong path so i think you hit the nail on the head right it's not just about putting information in front of you i know one of the modules that i participated in we actually talked through how do you go about finding quality information so it's not only just giving you you know giving you a meal it's teaching you how to cook the meal and i think that's really key especially when you're first diagnosed you're a little bit emotional i know i was a lot emotional right so walking some walking me through how to get the right information would have been you know a godsend at that point in time dr Cobb, what is the overall takeaway that someone living with ms is going to get from kind of going through these modules I think the overall message that a person living with MS can take away from the MS Path to Care modules is that they are the the center point of a of an important team. They are not alone. They have a, an array of individuals who are very well trained to help them manage whatever MS brings into their lives. And I, you know, I think to Marcus's point, although that's certainly true when you're newly diagnosed and, and this is all very, very new and, and alarming and just upsetting, 
It's also true that when you've been living with MS for a while and perhaps you have more symptoms or your symptoms have become more advanced and you're not sure that there's anything out there for you anymore, that that's another very important time to be able to identify who the specialists are that can really help you optimize your care. So we want people to know that they can come here to learn who those specialists are, how they can work with them in a comfortable way, making sure that their healthcare providers know what their priorities are as an individual with MS, as a family, because those priorities should direct a person's care. And that has to be collaborative. I think collaborative is is the magic word there. I think that sometimes people come into that appointment with their neurologist or one of the specialists feeling like this person I'm going to see, they know what they know. So my job is to listen to what they have to say. Talk a little bit about the the benefit of that collaborative process, those open conversations that ought to be going on. So there's an old expression I know of that came from my days as a a parent of teenagers, but there's a book out there called Talk So Your Children Will Listen and Listen So Your Children Will Talk. And I think that's a really important life lesson, right, that in order for doctors and other healthcare providers to work effectively with patients and families, it has to be a two-way street. The, the obviously you go to a healthcare provider you trust to give you the best information. But if your needs and priorities aren't taken into account, there can be a, 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 a disconnect, right? You're, you're not working together to achieve identified goals. And then the person with MS is less likely to adhere to a treatment plan or less likely to feel, uh, well taken care of. So they have to talk to each other and listen so that the plan that they devise is one that has a good chance of working. So it sounds like deciding not to go down the passive path and instead becoming an active participant in your own treatment has some real benefits, Marcus. I was going to actually say you have to be your own advocate. I know other people, you know, their organizations, their patient advocates, they say bring a family member with you to your appointment so that they can kind of take notes and remember things that you don't remember. But what it really comes down to as a patient is you have to be your own advocate. You can't just assume that that practitioner, you know, you can't assume they know everything. Because you're the one living with it. You're probably doing your own research. Maybe you found something that they didn't know that you can bring to the table. You know, because every, I'm lucky enough that I go to an MS specialty center, right? But other folks may go to general neurologists who aren't as up on the latest cutting edge research research who don't know all the resources like an MS path to care that are out there because they're dealing with a multitude of different diseases, right? So you have to, as a patient, be an advocate for yourself. And sometimes you have to bring in things and say, hey, doctor, so-and-so, check this out. You know, have you seen this? What do you think about this? I know I had an experience about a year ago where a new, um, MS treatment came out, the Ocrevus came out, right? And I actually sent my doctor an email and said, hey, you know, have you seen this? How would this work out for me? And then we were able to have a conversation on what the pluses for for me would be and what the minuses for me would be, right? So you have to, you know, you've got to be an advocate and an active participant in your treatment and not just stand by and think, well, the doctor knows everything, so they'll tell me if there's something that I need to do. So we've spent the last few minutes talking about all the very good reasons why someone needs to advocate on their own behalf, why they need to be an active participant in their own treatment. Uh, and it sounds like the modules that make up MS Path to Care are the how-to guide to making that happen, to empowering people with the information they need to make it happen. Uh, And people can find those modules at mspathtocare.com. And I thank you both for your time. And that's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. I'm going to be on vacation next week, 
but I'm inviting you to listen to a rebroadcast of one of the early episodes of the podcast that features a terrific conversation about depression and MS with Dr. Amy Sullivan, the Director of Behavioral Medicine Research and Training at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. I'll be back in two weeks with a brand new podcast episode. My name is John Strum. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.